It was the midst of the Cold War. There was hostility, but oh, there was to come eventually some negotiations that softened the relationship. But until then, it was still pretty, pretty intense. And you remember, there. remember, I got there. I got there in '72. In '73, you had the Yom Kippur War between Israel and the Arab states, in which uh, the Russians felt the United States had betrayed them by supporting Israel. Uh, so there was tension all the time. And your wife and children were there. Oh yeah, they right. came there, and my, I tell you, we studied a little bit of Russian. And my kids studied a little bit of Russian. And uh, one of my first experiences was taking my son and daughter by their hands and walking them into a Russian school, past the statue of Lenin, <laughs> singing at the Internationale. <laughs> when I think about it, it's just wild. And my kids, my kids were wonderful. They were so they were young. And they were fertile <laughs> brains, and... Uh, How old were they at that point, approximately? Oh, my daughter must have been six or seven. My son was about four. And, and, then, and then one of the teachers one day, uh, they, they had learned a little few Russian phrases back in Chicago with the uh, teacher's aid of the, of the um, instructor that I had. And she was teaching them Russian phrases by using a Sesame Street's book. This is one page of these sinister six or seven guys she was learning, teaching them how to conjugate by looking at these sinister guys. And she described them as Amerikanski Spion, American spies. <laughs> and sure enough, one day in class, the teacher is referring to me as an Amerikanski Spion, American spy. <laughs> and all the kids who until then had been friendly with our kids got very uptight. And wouldn't play with them, wouldn't, and the kids would come home crying. And I told Hedrick Smith of the New York Times this. He was my neighbor. I said, Rick, he says, ah, oh. I said, it must have been something you misunderstood. I said, well, I'm just telling you it happened. So sure enough, the next day his kids came home and said the same thing. And that's where we all decided to take our kids and put them in the international school. Did, did you feel in jeopardy there ever? Never, never felt in jeopardy, but I'll tell you, it's a strange, uh, imperceptible suspicion and feeling you had when you know you're being watched. We knew our phone was bugged. We knew we had a Soviet our mili militia man outside the building. We knew our, our driver's licenses were different than anybody else's. I mean, Russian license plates were white with black letters. Foreigners were black license plate with white letters. And on our license plate, it said K-04. K for correspondent, O-4 for American. So every time we drove our car any place, there were, some, there were militia men on every street corner, and they would f telephone ahead, here comes the American, here comes the American. Now, if we, we had a driver with a separate car, but he also had the same license plate. So wherever we went, we were, we were tracked. And what kind of, I mean, what, what kind of access did you have there? How, how, does, one, how does one go about reporting no. in a communist country? Well, you, you report the country by reporting the shadows, by talking to dissidents, by talking to people who will talk to you. And those are largely dissidents, or in that case, the Soviet Jews, who were trying to get out of the country. Uh, you had snippets of conversation with Russians who understood a little bit of English. You talked to people in the think tanks, Russian Soviet think tanks, who were feeding you the party line. But, uh, but the dissidents, did you uh, were those were those conversations secretive and how? how? Well, sure. I mean, it, well, if you ask you... me if they were broadcast, no, they were not broadcast. Actually, they were recorded. No, they were not recorded. Uh, but just but couldn't, you couldn't put their lives in jeopardy because of a, a little two-minute story I might get on the air. And as a matter of fact, the problem with my coverage of the Soviet Union in nearly three years is I did mostly radio uh, because I had to rely on the Soviets to provide, a, to provide a, chorus, a cameraman and a sound man for me. And the only way you could get that cameraman and sound was, it was to write a letter ahead of time for a story that you wanted to do. So if there was a breaking story, you couldn't get it like snapping your fingers. So, but when you met with these people secretly, how did you do that if you were being watched all the time? You just found ways to which to uh, work it out at night, prearrangement. Uh, one night we had two uh, Soviets uh, 
We picked him up, had him lay down in the car in the back seat so that nobody could see them. We brought them in to the compound and then took them up to the house, up to the apartment to eat. But most of the time we went out and went out to their home, homes and tried to uh, do the best we could to cover our tracks. Mm -hmm. Which were being followed, no? We weren't being, it wasn't that obvious. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was compelling and we developed friendships with a lot of these people. Mm 